You can clap. It's good. Those kids are great, weren't they? Man, you got, you got to love what kids think about and what they're thankful for. We're going to talk about some things we can be thankful for today. And uh, I want to welcome you to our Paradise Campus. Those of you that are watching online, it is a joy to have you with us week after week after week. I hope you'll engage with your online host today uh, as we continue with our service. I'm stoked. I love Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but I love Thanksgiving. And uh, this is an exciting time of the year for me and for us. In fact, uh, my wife, Janet, loves Thanksgiving. I heard her in the kitchen this week. She was looking at some new ways to fix turkey, and I overheard her singing this. It's all about that bass, about that bass, about that bass. You know it's... She's looking at me with eyes that could kill right now, but anyhow... You know, it, it, it's just fun when you think about Thanksgiving, and there's so many things we can be uh, thankful for. I, I don't know about you, but I, I've really been thinking about that uh, this year, about the things I'm grateful for. In spite of all the turmoil that we have in our nation and in our world, there are so many things I am thankful for. And if I had to ask you to list maybe five or six things that you're thankful for, what would come to your mind, like immediately? What's in your mind right now? Think about that. As I was doing that, of course, uh, in my mind, I thought about my wife, Janet. I'm thankful for her. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for my grandchildren. I'm thankful for the fact that my kids all are following Jesus. So I'm, I'm grateful for Jesus, of course. I'm grateful for our church. And I'm grateful that the Cowboys will probably get the number one pick in the draft next year. So some of you are not thankful for that. But anyhow, you know, it's probably going to happen. But here, here's what I want you to do for just a minute. Um, I don't know what's on your list. But if you had to narrow it down to just one thing, what would it be? If it was just one thing that you wrote down that you were thankful for, what would it be? I mean, think about it for just a minute. Now, for a young lady from Atlanta, it was getting a job. Check this out. All right, here's a good bright spot. And it actually involves jobs, friends. Dakara Spence from Atlanta just hired a young woman for a new job. Now, you know that feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Especially now. Yes. You just want that job. But the security <laughs> footage, <laughs> here we go, shows the woman walking out into the parking lot, and this happened. She didn't know, but 500,000 views later, it's trending on Instagram. This is adorable. Okay, let's see. We don't know who she is. We don't know her name. But this was captured after being told she landed the gig. Both ways and oh, oh, She yes. got it. She got it. Yes. She got it. It all <laughs> sunk in. Like, I got yeah. it. I got it. And so they saw this on the security footage, and they've shared it. So congrats to you, whoever you are. We are happy for you. A happy dance if there ever was one. She was grateful. And, and the backstory now, we know that uh, she had lost a number of jobs because of COVID. She had been homeless uh, for two years. And then when she got this job, man, I mean, that was her reaction. She had no idea that people were watching. It was caught on security footage. And now it's gone viral as she did a happy dance. But we've all been there, haven't we? I mean, you, 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 maybe you wanted to make a team. Or you, you wanted to uh, get a part in a play, or you were wanting to get that job, or maybe it's something else. And then you go to check the list to see if your name's on the list for the team or whatever it may be to play. Or you get a call from HR and they've added you to payroll. And what do you do, man? I mean, you are grateful and you do your own version of the happy dance, right? Because you're excited about it. Here's what's so interesting to me is that some of Jesus' early followers found out how important it is to rejoice when your name's been written on a specific list. Luke was a doctor in the first century. And he's a guy that traveled for several years with the eyewitnesses that saw the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he traveled with them because according to his gospel, he wanted to put together an accurate account of the life and the death the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he did that. And in Luke 10, if we move to Luke 10, the Bible tells us this, or Luke tells us this from the eyewitnesses, that Jesus chose a number of additional disciples besides the 12. So these were additional disciples, and he sent them out into the cities, the country, and the places that he planned to visit. And here's what Jesus told these disciples. Some 70 to 72 disciples, this is what he told them. He said, look, the harvest is abundant, for there are many who need to hear the good news about salvation, 
but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord to send out workers into his harvest. Now, th this is so critical. I mean, it's so critical for us to get this and for us to understand this. I mean, uh, if you uh, are a farmer, if you are a rancher, you realize, you, you realize how difficult the harvest is, right? And most of us know farmers and ranchers in our area. I mean, you know how difficult it is to get, a, to get in a harvest. It just is. It's hard work. I remember in college working for some of the ranchers in West Texas and just harvesting hay. Back then, it wasn't all automated. It was square bales. And we had to, you know, lift them, put them on the, all that kind of stuff. Man, I'm telling you, we loved it when we had more workers to help. And Jesus is telling these guys that he's sending out, look, your job is going to be difficult, but it's also going to be dangerous. I mean, it's going to be dangerous. But the need for people to be involved in this harvest is of utmost importance because this harvest is not about crops like we think about, but it's about people. He said, it's about people who need to be saved. It's about people who need to know me. And then he went on and he said, listen, it's going to be dangerous because you have an enemy named Satan and he's going to try to distract you. In fact, he'll try to destroy you if he can, but I'm going to give you power over Satan and power over demons. And I'm going to give you the power to heal. And I want you to not get distracted and not get sidetracked because your mission is critical. It's mission critical. And so these guys went out where, where Jesus told them to go, and they came back. Look at what they said. This is so incredible. It said, the men came back in great joy. Say great joy with me. Great joy. What kind of joy? Great joy. It wasn't just a little bit of joy. It was a lot of joy, right? I mean, they were excited. They came back in great joy, and they said this. Lord, they said, even the demons obeyed us when, they gave, when we gave them a command in your name. I mean, can you imagine that kind of power? Can you imagine if you were able to do that? I mean, think about it. If you've got family members or friends who don't follow Jesus and you want them to, can you imagine being able to go to them and begin to share with them about Jesus and then you know they're being deceived in some way, form, or fashion, and because you know that, you are able to actually stop the deception. You're able to have the power to stop that. I mean, wouldn't it be cool to be able to go into our communities and our schools and at work with that kind of power? And these new disciples that Jesus sent out, they had that kind of power because they were obedient to Jesus. And they came back. I mean, they were filled with joy and gratitude and excitement. And then Jesus said something that, that, that is just astounding. In fact, I read this a few weeks ago in my time on with God, and it just grabbed me. I want you to see what Jesus said. This is so cool. Jesus said to these guys, hey, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Can you, I, look, I grew up out in West Texas and we've got rattlesnakes everywhere. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to go out to your ranch, your farm, or wherever you are, see a rattlesnake and just stomp his head? I mean, wouldn't that be cool? You could just do that, not any fear at all. Pick up a scorpion, man, see you later, dude. You know, I mean, just all, I've given you power to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, and nothing's going to harm you, and this is what caught my attention. However, do not rejoice. Don't, don't spend all your time giving thanks that the Spirit submit to you, but, read it with me, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Don't just rejoice that you've got this incredible power, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I mean, think about that for a minute. I mean, Jesus was telling them, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing that you're able to do the things you do in the power I gave you. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that you can speak and demons have to shut up. But here's what I want you to understand. Your greatest joy and your greatest reason for giving hope should be that your names are written in heaven. And the picture from the original language of that is of the divine action of God in heaven writing your name in heaven the book of life. And it's talked about all through the New Testament, but especially in the book of Revelation. And basically, here's our key phrase for the day. This is what Jesus was saying. If your name's written in the book of life, give God thanks for eternal life. All right. Now you can't say that without some gusto. So say it with me. If your name's written in the book of life, give God thanks for eternal life. Boom, shaka laka, right? I mean, that's incredible. If your name's written in the book of life, give God thanks for eternal life. Now, most scholars believe that Luke 10 
was written also in parallel to Luke 13 when he wrote that. And in Luke 13, Jesus is talking to people, and here's what he's talking about. I want you to be sure that you have eternal life. I want you to be sure that you are saved. In fact, as he was doing that, somebody asked this question. Somebody said to Jesus, Lord, will only a few people be saved? It's a legit question. Is there only going to be a few people that are saved? And, and he wasn't talking about saved, you know, like from some physical malady or illness or something like that. He was talking about something much more significant. This guy was asking, are only a few people going to be saved spiritually? Is it only a few people whose souls are actually going to be saved and spend eternity with you in heaven? Is it only a few people whose souls are going to be saved from the second death? The second death is spiritual separation from God for eternity. Because see, eternal life means, eternal life is simply this. It means that you have real life that begins now and it lasts forever and it's only available to you through Jesus. So he's asking about that. I mean, how's this going to work out? And this is what Jesus said when he said that. He said, many will try to enter by their own works and will not be able. A lot of people are going to try to, to enter into heaven or to what God has uh, for those who believe in him. They want to enter by their own works and they're not going to be able. There are a lot of people trying to get there because they're trying to, you know, because they joined a church or maybe they got baptized or maybe, maybe they're good. They, they look at themselves, well, I'm better than so-and-so or they do a lot of uh, good things in the community. I mean, they're trying all kinds of things. In fact, there is a very frightening passage in, in Luke 13 and he's talking about there can be a lot of people trying to knock on the door to get into the banquet in heaven and God's going to say, go away because I never knew you. And they're going to be saying, well, look, what we did in your night, I never knew you go away. And that's why Jesus was saying it's so important that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved. And Jesus, along with the eyewitnesses of his resurrection that wrote the Gospels and what we have in the New Testament, make it absolutely clear that the only way you can be sure that your name's written in the book of life and you're going to be saved and have eternal life is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's it. Faith in Jesus Christ alone. And then God gave John. John, John was a guy that, that lived with Jesus. He was one of the first disciples. And he, he was there when Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead and radically changed. And, and, and God gave John a vision to write for us after he was exiled. And by himself, he gave him this incredible vision. And it's what we call the book of Revelation. It talks a lot about the end times. And, and John began to write down what God showed him. And if you start reading like in Revelation 20, here's the picture that he painted. He said, I saw this great white throne and God was on it. And standing before him were all the people of, of all eternity who had died. Those who nobody even knew about, the lowest person on the totem pole, and people that were incredibly famous, and they were all standing before God. And books were open and they were being judged. And then another book was opened called the book of life. And, and this is what God told John to write in Revelation 20. Check this out. Then after that scene, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake of fire, the eternal separation from God. By the way, you know that hell is simply being separated from God, right? The picture is hard, but it means to be separated from God. And so the eternal separation from God and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Anyone whose name was not recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And some of you are going, Pastor BJ, are you trying to scare us? No, absolutely not. I am trying to share with you God's truth that removes all of your fear. Amen. All of your fear. You don't have to be afraid of dying. Because you can know for certain that your name's written in the book of life. Again, here it is. If your name's written in the book of life, what? Give God thanks for eternal life. I mean, you can know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And some of you go, well, how can I know for sure? I mean, are you sure I can know? Yes, I'm absolutely certain you can know. And while none of us can judge your relationship with God, we don't know if it's real or legit or not. You know if it is. And you know if you're sure. Or if you're just kind of hoping you're sure. Or if you're not sure. And if you're unsure, then why don't you settle it today? In fact, Paul was a guy, Paul was a guy who hated Christians, hated the name of Jesus. We talk about him a lot. 
And then he became a follower of Jesus because he had a personal encounter with Jesus after the resurrection and realized Jesus is legit. He's Messiah and God. And God used him to write much of the New Testament and start churches. And Paul wrote a letter to a church just like ours, okay? And this is what he said to the people that were a part of that church. Check this out. Are you really Christians? Are you really? Do you pass the test? Or are you just pretending to be Christians when actually you aren't at all? You know what Paul understood? Paul understood the problem with self-deception. And how easy it is to base our relationship with God on the things that we think that we do that are good as opposed to a relationship with Jesus. And he wanted us to be absolutely certain. He knew that our eternity was at stake and he wanted us to be certain. So he said, you need to test yourselves. Make sure that your faith is right so you don't have any fear. And this guy, John, that we talked about a while ago that wrote the book of Revelation, he wrote another book. It's called the letter to John, the first letter to John, our first John. It's in the back of your Bible. And in it, he gives us some simple things to help us to, to really examine ourselves to see if we are really saved, okay? And so we're going to talk about this. You might want to write them down in the note card there. But here's the very first one. Here's the first of these four tests we're going to talk about. You can be absolutely certain that your name's written in the book of life if you've believed in and received Jesus. And here's, here's the deal I want you to understand. You either have or you haven't. There is no in-between. You've either believed in and received Jesus or you haven't. And so John says this. This is what he writes in 1 John. In 1 John, he says this. He who has the Son, by accepting Him as Lord and Savior, has the life that is eternal. He who does not have the Son of God by personal faith does not have the life. It's just that simple. You say, well, what is personal faith? Personal faith is to believe. It's to trust. It's not just to know facts about. It's not just to, to recognize things about Jesus, but it's literally to rely upon it. It's where you come to the point where you're convinced that you know that Jesus died on the cross for you and your sins and that he was raised from the dead, which proves he was who he claimed to be and that he is God, Lord, and Messiah and the only way that you can be saved. So have you believed in and received it? And if you have, then John says, check this out. Here's the second thing. It'll be evidenced by his spirit in our what? Our lifestyles. It'll be evident by his spirit in our lifestyles. Okay? And John wrote about that. Look at what he said in 1 John 3. He, he, he simply said this. He said, by this we know and have the proof that he really abides in us, that he lives in us. By the Spirit whom He's given us as a gift. Now, here, here is the deal. When you believe in and receive Jesus, when you put your faith and trust in Him to follow Him, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, to take up residence in you, and what happens in your life? You begin to change. It's, it's evident that He lives within you. And that guy, Paul, we talked about it a minute ago. He said, hey, look, I'm going to show you some ways you can kind of do a self-check. These things ought to be evident in your life if you really belong to Jesus. And it is it, the fruit of the Spirit. He said the fruit of the Spirit, that is the result of His presence living within us, is love, which is unselfish concern for others, joy, inner peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the question for you and the question for me is, are those things showing up in your life in more abundance? Is it becoming more clear that that's the, the direction of your life? Or do you see those things? Are they growing in your life? Is God producing those in your life? If not, you need to do a heart check. And then he went on and, and he said this. This is what he said. John said, whoever says he lives in Christ, that is whoever says he's accepted him as God and Savior or Lord and Savior, ought to walk and conduct himself just as he, or Jesus, walked and conducted himself. In other words, the most evident test of an authentic believer is a changed life, where you're becoming more and more like Jesus on a regular basis in spite of the fact that we still mess up. We still mess up. We, we've talked about this for a long time here, right? We live in direction, not perfection. You got that? None of us are going to be perfect. We're still going to mess up. We're, we're, going to, we're going to blow it, right? We're going to do that. But here's the thing. An authentic believer in Jesus 
will be moving in the direction of becoming more and more like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit will be evident. And then his characteristics. I mean, there ought to be things in you. Are you becoming more pure? Are you becoming more loving toward everyone, no matter who they are? Are you becoming more selfless? I mean, are you putting God first? Because those are the characteristics right there, okay? So here's the question that you should be asking that I've asked myself. That what does the direction of my life reveal about me? Are you moving in that direction and living as Jesus did? And then the third exam. The third exam or test was simply this. We ought to show love for others. Well, we've heard that a lot, right? If you've been in the church a lot, yeah, you've got to love everybody. You've got to love God. In fact, Jesus said the greatest command is that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, he said everything in the scripture, the law and the prophets, they hang on these two commands. So that's the most important thing. But then God directed John to write a little bit more about this to help us with these tests to be sure we're saved in 1 John. In 1 John 3, this is what he said. Anyone who does not demonstrate righteousness and show love to fellow believers is not living with God as his source. So people who don't love fellow believers or demonstrate that kind of love for fellow believers, he's just saying, hey, God's not your source of life. And he went on in, in, in verse 14, he said this, he, he said, yet we can be assured that we have been translated from spiritual death to spiritual life. That means you've been saved, right? Your name's written in the Lamb's book of life or written in the book of life. You've been translated from spiritual death into spiritual life because we love the family of believers. We love the family of believers. And so, you know what God's saying here? We can't judge anyone, but here's what he's saying. Listen, if you find someone that claims to be a follower of Christ and yet they don't love or want to be a part of the family of believers, or if you are that person, then you need to do a serious heart check because what God says about you is this, is that there you are showing signs of spiritual death, not spiritual life. You don't love the family of believers. And then he said this, this is the fourth test. You'll turn from sin and trust God's commands. You'll turn from sin and trust God's God's commands. Turn from sin and trust God's commands. Here's how he said it. Check this out. Those who have been born into God's family, saved, made right with Jesus, they believe and receive Jesus, do not make it a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So you're not going to make it a practice of sinning. Hey, I know what you're thinking because I know what I think. You know, well, I still sin. So what does that mean? Okay. Well, if you read 1 John 2, John's very clear. You and I are going to continue to sin. We are just, we're going to mess up. But we have an advocate named Jesus. He's an advocate before God the Father, and he's the one that encourages us, and he's the one that helps us, and he's the one that helps us overcome sin. So here's what he's talking about here. So sin is not our habitual desire or direction. Now, I'm, I know what some of you may be thinking because I have some friends in, in this situation. Well, what about someone who has an addiction? Who has an addiction? Well, you know what? Most of the people that I know, that I've met, that know Jesus, who are addicted, they want to get out of that addiction. And it's not easy. It is very difficult at times. But the first step that you need to take, if that's you, is to admit it. That is the number one step. You have to admit you have an issue. And then you need to seek help. And I've seen so many people overcome addictions with the power of God and the help of a biblical counselor or a small group. But it's a journey, and it's not an easy one. But here, what Jesus is simply saying through John is this, is that if you belong to me, it's not going to be your desire to stay in that sin. It's just not going to be your nature. Now look, when I first became a follower of Jesus, I still had a lot of issues, language, drugs, alcohol, um, that I didn't overcome immediately. In fact, when it came to alcohol, I couldn't just drink a beer, um, and I would get wasted, and it just bothered me. It just bothered me that I didn't have any control, that I couldn't stop. And, and, and I realized that wasn't what God wanted because the Scripture says it is a sin to get drunk, that, that that's not what God's desire is for me. And, and I, I, didn't, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to live the way God wanted me to. And, and, but I was weak early on, and I had to grow in my relationship with God, and I had to have people around me that helped me. And as I began to grow in that relationship, things began to change. 
And I begin to demonstrate a love for what God said in his word, which is a sign again that you belong to him. In fact, this is what John said about it in 1 John. He said this, here's how we can be sure that we've truly come to know God if we keep his commands. If someone claims I've come to know God yet doesn't keep God's commands, he's a phony and the truth finds no place in him. So, I mean, it's just a simple picture right there, right? So if you have believed in and received Jesus, there'll be evidence in your life. And I believe you're going to have a desire to do what he says in his word. Again, not in perfection, but in direction. And if that's not true of you and you have no desire to do what God says in his word, then you need to do a heart check. That's what God says. Listen, John wrote about these tests not to scare us, but to give us security and to give us hope. And he wrote them for our good because God wants you to know and to be certain that you are saved so that you can rejoice not only at Thanksgiving, but all year long. Why? Because of this. If your name's written in the book of life, then give God thanks for eternal life. Say it with me again with gusto. If your name's written in the book of life, give God thanks for eternal life. Years ago, uh, some of our close friends, uh, their oldest son, uh, his name was Tim. And Tim was a really good kid. We loved this family. But when Tim got into high school, he went full scale, off the rails, rebellion. And after he got out of high school, it got worse. And, and this young man was a young man who had been baptized as a young boy and, and became a member of the church, you know, and then everything was okay, I guess he thought. But there was no evidence of God in his life whatsoever. And he and I had a good relationship because he knew of my background and my trouble with, with alcohol and drugs and all that stuff. And so he knew about me. And so I, I called him when some things were really getting really bad. And I asked him, say, hey, why don't you meet me down at Shoney's and I'll buy you a cup of coffee and pie there in Bozier. And he agreed to do that. And we sat there for a little while. I just looked at him because he, he knew I cared about him greatly. And I just, what's going on, man? I mean, what is going on in your life? And we talked about that for a little while. And then I pulled out this pocket New Testament that I, I've had for 30-something years, and I've carried it with me. And I opened it up to, to 1 John. I was going to share a few things with him. And as I opened it up, today, Janet must have washed this with my jeans because the words have shrunk. I'm telling you, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. But anyhow, um, I, I opened it up and I actually just handed it to him and I asked him to read like these passages we just talked about and to think on them. I didn't really give him any commentary. I just asked him. And then I said, well, what, what do you think, man? And he looked at me with this, this sincerity in his eyes and he said, BJ, I'm not saved. And I asked him a question I think that is a legit question. I asked him, well, do you really want to be? And he said, yes, I need help. I, I, I need to change my life. It's out of control. And so we walked out to my truck and he prayed and he believed in and received Jesus. Amen. And it was absolutely incredible. His family was so excited. I was so excited. And that brought us such incredible comfort to know because just a few months later, his life tragically ended. But Tim's in heaven now. And I know that, and he knows that. So here, here's the thing about today that I want you to get. Look, if you're sure that you've believed in and received Jesus, you should have no fear, man. I mean, you, you, you ought to be the happiest person in the world. And you ought to be given thanks. Give God thanks. Why? Because your name's written in the book of life. And if your name's written in the book of life, you ought to be one of those workers in the harvest helping others to realize their need. And here's what I've discovered in my life. Listen, if you're not there, I've discovered this, that following Jesus makes me better at life and it just makes life better. And it doesn't remove all the problems. It just makes the path clearer. So here's the deal. If you're not sure, if you're not sure about this, settle it today. Because you can have absolute assurance and know. That's what John wrote in 1 John 5, 13. I've written these things to you, believe in Jesus, so you can know that you have eternal life. So settle it today. Maybe you've not been thinking about that at all, but you, you know, today you realize, hey, you know what I need? I need Jesus. I need to believe in and receive Jesus into my life. And if that's what you want, we can tell him together. But it starts with repentance. In like fact, when Jesus first started preaching his first sermons, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. To repent means to change direction. Sin is when I choose to live life my way. I'm going my way. To repent means I change my mind and change my direction to go 
God's way. So let me, let me just illustrate that for you this way, okay? For the first 19 years of my life, I was going my own direction, doing my own thing, didn't care much about what God thought. Yeah, did I do some good things? Yeah, I did some good things. But I did a lot of things that were wrong. And, and sometimes I would be pushed to kind of do things that are right or kind of push toward God. But, 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 oh, but I just keep doing my own thing because that was my nature. But even as we sang about today and talked about today, when I chose to trust and follow Jesus, what happened is I flipped the script or actually God flipped the script. And I started choosing to go his way as I put my faith and trust in him. Did I still mess up? Yeah. And do I still have temptations? Yeah, all the time I have temptations. You know, oh, don't, don't forgive. Don't do, or do that. Oh. But because my nature has changed, now I have more power to keep moving in his direction. And so here, here's the deal. God will give you the power to say no, but you got to grow in that relationship. So, but the first step is for you to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so I just want to ask you this. If you want to be sure of this and settle it if you haven't, and you want to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today, we can tell him together. And you can pray something like this in your own words. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for just a minute. You don't have to close your eyes. But if that's your desire and you want to get this settled today, then would you pray something like this in your own words? Jesus, I don't fully understand all of this. But I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you were raised from the dead. Which proves you're Lord and God. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I want to live your way now, not my way. So I receive you into my life as Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer in the sincerity of your heart, whether you're watching online or you're here, it's the greatest decision that you'll ever make. And here's what I want to encourage you to do. Now you need to take some next step. That's just the beginning of the journey. What are the next steps? Well, the next step is to let somebody know. Let your family know. Let your friends know. Let your pastor know. We would love to know as a church, whether you're watching online or here, let us know so we can help you grow in your relationship with him. And then as you do that, the next step you need to take is to be baptized. And some of you are going, well, I've already been baptized. That's right. Tim was baptized as a child, but then after he became a follower of Jesus as a teenager, he was baptized again. I have the same story. If you just settle this and you just made certain that you're saved, then be baptized as a result of it and, and proclaim your faith in Jesus Christ. And then beyond that, get involved in a local church somewhere. Begin to serve. Get involved in a life group. I mean, do the things that will help you grow. And this Thanksgiving and beyond... No matter what comes your way, this is the deal, all right? Say it with me. If your name's written in the book of life, give God thanks for eternal life. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your truth that sets us free, your truth that helps us have assurance that we belong to you, that our names are written uh, in, in the book of life. God, thank you for what you gave John to write so we could know that. And Paul, all these, just help us. And for people that maybe are still struggling, God, I pray they would ask some questions and let us, if, if they've got obstacles, let us have a conversation to help them. So thanks for today. Thanks for the people who prayed to receive you. All the angels in heaven you said are celebrating and we celebrate with them too. We give you praise and thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.